Hello, I'm Adam Rutherford. I'm a scientist and a writer, but most importantly, I'm a member of the species Homo sapiens, the latest in a long line of ape-like creatures. Now, human beings may have their biological faults, such as back pain or problems during labour, but as a species, we're pretty successful. We've developed the ability to walk upright, to talk and to reason. We're the product of millions of years of evolution, as Charles Darwin worked out from his observations of the world around him. Darwin transformed our understanding of nature and the teaching of science forever. But in this programme, we'll be asking whether that understanding is being threatened and whether that teaching is being undermined. Creationism, we're led to believe, is making a comeback. Adam and Eve are breaking out from the church, mosque and synagogue and moving into the classroom, the science classroom. Goodbye the descent of man, hello the fall of man. I want to examine the issues and find out whether people like me, atheists to the core, have got anything to worry about. The answer seems to be yes when I find out that an increasing number of students are starting science degrees with creationist views. Well, in the first year of evolution course, I think about 20% of them perhaps would profess overtly to be creationist, have creationist views, um, which, which I find quite surprising from, from my background and my training. And the issue is causing enough concern to prompt calls for teachers to be better equipped to deal with religion in science lessons. I think a lot of biology teachers feel extremely uncomfortable when issues to do with creationism or intelligent design are raised, mainly because it's not in their comfort zone. They weren't trained often to teach in these sorts of ways, requiring extensive argumentation and discussion. As we hear from Darwin's great-great-grandson, his theories and his methods must be placed at the heart of science education. It's the rigour and imagination with which he approached each problem that he tackled using observation and experience that's so wonderful, I think, and such an example for us all today. Darwin lived and worked here, Down House near Bromley in Kent. Two thousand and nine brings the bicentenary of his birth and also sees the passing of 150 years since the publication of The Origin of Species, his great work which shattered religious perceptions. It was along this lane that he thought through his ideas and worried about them. So Randall, this is Darwin's thinking path. Do you think he was considering when walking here the wider implications of his theory? He must have been, very often. It was a great concern of his, and he would walk round this path every day four or five times and would have been thinking through every implication of the theory. Darwin delayed publishing his conclusions because of those implications, that we're not descended from Adam and Eve, we're just another species that evolved like all the others. He wanted to make sure he could counter every argument and satisfy every objection. For 150 years, no one has been able to undermine his theory using science rather than religion. Jeremy Pritchard of Birmingham University is a biologist who specialises in plants but uses bones to engage students when explaining the evolutionary process. With an almost missionary zeal, he's reaching out to schools to promote Darwinism and combat creationism. I think some teachers perhaps have creationist views and don't want to disabuse them of it. I think others, other teachers are, are too busy. It, uh, explaining to somebody evolution, you need quite a lot of knowledge beforehand. You can say, how can a, a 747 evolve by chance in one go? But if you were to go to the factory and explain this is how it's put together bit by bit, that would take a lot longer, and it's the same analogy in science. Six formers are invited to use the university's laboratories and resources. In this exercise, they're tracing the development of cranial capacity. They can use the fossil record and any passing living specimen. This is a very familiar position from my undergraduate days, although mostly I was asleep at the time. 
move your head from that position. That looks like I've got quite a prominent brow there, which is a characteristic of uh, Neanderthals. I'm not sure I'm happy about that. I think as a scientist, it's very important to engage. I mean, we're obviously ac often accused of being in the ivory tower and not coming down and, and talking to people about our science, so, so that's it. Obviously, it's a, a recruitment thing as well. It's important that people know the sort of things you can study at university and, and how you can further your A-level studies. And it's also, um, it's also because of the, some of the evolution questions you've been raising that I personally think we should address some of these and we should take people on. We shouldn't sit there and, and hide and not, not talk about it. And uh, the human evolution story obviously is a great context because everybody's human. So Shiv, you're, you're a Hindu. How does, how does learning about evolution in this way conflict with, with your religious beliefs? I wouldn't say they necessarily conflict. What, what I would say though is that I personally believe that God created the first initial species and that, that species has slowly evolved over time and created what you say the peak of evolution which is us at the moment, at the current time. Who knows where it will be in 2000 years time. Where better to see the effect of billions of years of evolution than the zoo, in this case, London Zoo. Birmingham University's Biosciences Department has invited nearly 200 sixth formers for a day out, its first attempt to reach a wider audience. The day starts in the Zoological Society's lecture hall. Right, evolution, that's really why we're here. Talk about evolution and where all that diversity that we see in the zoo has come from. Lowland gorillas. Four pairs of legs, no. gills, no. feathers, no. hair, yes. Yes. okay. Yes. You're going to look at these animals and make some decisions about 26, 27 characters I've suggested for about 45, 50 animals and we're going to score that in a binary form. So in your groups when you go out into the zoo I want you to identify the animals on the sheet, locate them on your map, put a one if you think the character is present and a zero if it's absent. Does it have claws? Yes. Thumb? No. What about parental care? What do we think? No. I don't think Komodos bury their eggs. I okay. think they put them in nests and incubate them. Okay. I just read that off the sign. <laughs> it's called scientific research. I know it's not a scientific sample, but in the straw poll conversations I had with students, almost all had faith, and none had a problem in accepting evolution. Personally, I'm, I'm a Christian myself, but I still, uh, I still believe in, in evolution, and I think that's a way that things should be. I kind of use the Bible to influence my decisions. I don't solely base my life on like religious teachings and stuff. They kind of just guide me along the way, and I go along with what scientists say about the evolution of animals where we do evolve from apes. The students' data are fed into a programme which groups all the species according to their characteristics and comes up with this. A phylogenetic tree. Got, yeah, you've got all the mammals here in that group. And then, and then you've got a fly, blue bottle. So when you look at this output, does this help you connect up all, all of the different species that you've been looking at? Yeah, because you can yeah. see that, yeah. Yeah. where they derive from each other. And does that help you understand how evolution works? Yeah, it does, because yeah, you, can see, yeah. you can see who's kind of grouped together now, and then you can see where they all stem from, so it's really interesting. A phylogenetic tree is the only diagram that appears in The Origin of Species. Darwin is best remembered for his voyages on HMS Beagle and his observations around the Galapagos Islands, but he also made use of what he saw here at London Zoo. And he relied even more on studying nature in his own backyard. It was his open-air laboratory, and just here, for example, we've got one of the 54 kinds of gooseberry that he cultivated here. And this was artificial selection, which was comparable to what nature does in natural selection. He shows from that how if you either artificially or naturally select the plants each generation, you can get the variations to develop into major differences between varieties which can eventually become separate species. So why was this field so important to Darwin? 
It was here that he looked closely at the phenomenon of biodiversity, really for the first time, to take one area with a uniform habitat and just count the number of different plants that were growing here. And he found that there were about 140 different species of plant growing in this one small area. So it really shows that you, you don't have to go all the way to the Galapagos Islands to, to get a real understanding of variation in nature. Exactly. So with all the evidence around us to support evolution, why is it being rejected by more and more pupils? I think that what's happening in America uh, has certainly uh, come over here in the sense that um, uh, the intelligent design debate in the States has spilled over into some of the faith schools here, has got into people's psyche and, and people are thinking about it. Um, I'm surprised it's a problem because, of course, in this country we have the safety valve of RE lessons, which you don't have in the States. So I, I really haven't got a, a full answer to it. I think, I think there is some agitation from the creationist side, though. For example, there's been some big mail shots of a lot of material, um, truth in creationism and stuff, to schools, and teachers often find it difficult to deal with that when they're multitasking other things. In 2006, an organisation called Truth in Science sent this material to every secondary school in the country, advocating the theory of intelligent design, the belief that nature is shaped by a higher entity. The organisation claimed that it had 59 positive responses from schools who said it was a useful classroom resource. Its impact has also been observed by Michael Rice, He's the Professor of Science Education at the Institute of Education and Director of Education at the Royal Society. He's also an ordained minister of the Church of England. Instead of sitting in his office, we invited him to take a pew at a nearby church. Within the Christian tradition, creationism has definitely become more powerful. Obviously that has been centred in the USA, but it's been exported from the USA, not just to the United Kingdom, but to other countries. The Truth in Science DVDs, which I've looked through, have not, in my experience, been widely used. This is mainly because most biology teachers think they're poor quality and reject them. A small number use them. They're more likely to use them to argue against their content, showing how some of the arguments are invalid than anything else. The government responded to truth in science by reminding schools that creationism and intelligent design are not scientific theories and have no place in the curriculum. But there's another reason for the increasing disbelief in evolution. The other reason is now we have a great many more children from Muslim families in schools in Britain and quite a high proportion of the Muslim community has creationist beliefs. In Islam, creationist beliefs are much more at the centre of mainstream religious faith. And therefore, as the number of Muslims in the United Kingdom increases, I'd expect to carry on seeing more and more Islamic students with creationist beliefs. The government also told schools that although creationism or intelligent design could not be taught in science lessons, teachers could respond to questions. Professor Rice is concerned that some may just avoid the issues altogether. I think avoiding the issue of creationism, intelligent design is a very common response from science teachers because teaching this area just doesn't fit into their understanding of what science is about very often. Some teachers would argue that they're pretty hard pushed for time. Do you, why, why do you think that they should address creationism? I'm not in favour at all of requiring science teachers to teach in this way, in this area, but if they feel comfortable doing so, I think it can be a better way of enabling pupils to learn about evolutionary biology than by merely either implying or telling them that they're wrong to reject evolutionary thinking. Why not take a, a black and white approach and a science teacher says, well, if a pupil comes to him and says, I, I want to learn about creationism, and he says, well, thank you for asking, go and talk to, to the vicar about that. What would be the problem with that approach? None. But there are disadvantages with that. The main problem that young people have with a lot of their school science lessons is they say they're boring. So what message are we sending when you finally get some pupils asking some genuine, heartfelt questions about science to be told, we're not going to discuss that here? Now, I'm told that there are plenty of science teachers out there who prefer to rely on the Koran or the Bible rather than the origin of species. And as we've heard, their influence is being felt in higher education. 
but it seems that they're not that willing to engage in debate with us. We've been in touch with a number of organisations that bring together religion and education, including the Association of Muslim Schools, Truth in Science and the Association of Christian Teachers. None of them could provide us with a teacher who is willing to talk to me. I had better luck at the Natural History Museum, where I discovered that evolution can be taught with both a scientific and religious perspective. The museum stages workshops called The Great Debate, which pit the arguments of Darwin against the beliefs of Sir Richard Owen. Owen was a Victorian naturalist and fervent Christian. He sponsored the building of the Natural History Museum as a cathedral to God's creation. The museum has a school's programmes developer who explained the purpose of the workshops. And so when you show these specimens, like we can see a manatee there and a, uh, a rhinoceros there and an elephant, and then of course all the amazing whales, how do you connect all those things together? We're trying to get the students to really think about the relationship between theory and evidence and how interpretations of evidence can be really, really different. What do you do when you actually come across a student who will just not accept it, flies in the face of all of that evidence? We have students in the workshop who have strong religious beliefs, but we really reinforce that it's fine for students to make up their own minds, to form their own opinions, um, but what we present is that the scientific community has brought together all this evidence and the best explanation that we have for that evidence at the moment is the theory of evolution by natural selection. So we say, bring that into your thinking, make your own minds up. The workshop starts next to Owen's statue, which used to be found on the main staircase, but he's been moved into a corner and replaced by Darwin. To be honest, I don't think Richard Owen would be that happy. It's his museum, he founded the museum. But I think, you know, for this year, for Darwin's birthday, it's fine. Owen and Darwin had a pretty fractious relationship anyway, didn't they? Um, to start with, they were, they were fine, um, but he's known as one of Darwin's chief opponents. After being introduced to the issues and characters, the pupils are split into groups representing the opposing sides of the great debate over evolution that all began in 1859. We set them challenges. We say, imagine that those characters were here today in the Natural History Museum, with all the, the modern evidence on display. How would they use that evidence to support their argument, either for or against evolution? And then you bring them together at the end and they fight it out? Yeah, they fight it out. The pupils are asked to focus on the pentadactyl, or five-fingered limb, common to mammals great and small. To Darwin, the limb showed that all mammals had descended from a common ancestor. To Owen, the limb was an archetype designed and perfected for each mammal by God. What have you just noted down there? You've put down that the, these bones are fused together on the whale specimen. What does that tell you? Of course the whales don't need to move their hands as much as we do, they just use them to swim along. So they fuse together over time. And, and does that say to you that it's a, a, a result of evolution or of design? I'd say it'd be evolution because it's just so I think it's happened gradually over time. You sort of come to conclusion that evolution is the stronger argument because there is that more solid evidence. The pupils come together for their own great debate. Are they completely taking God out of the equation and just saying that it was all randomly selected and it hadn't been designed by anyone else? If God was so smart, why did he not give all of the animals the advantageous characteristics? Then they would all live longer. If Darwin was so religious, why did he totally go against God and everything that was like in the Bible about God? He contradicted his religious beliefs because he believed that the evidence was much stronger for evolution than the argument for God. At last, I find a science teacher who has religious convictions and has the courage of those convictions to talk to me. He's the head of science, accompanying these pupils from a grammar school for girls in Wilmington in Kent. But from a personal point of view, uh, I am quite religious, <laughs> which is perhaps unfortunate as a science teacher. So I kind of believe in mutual exclusivity. I think it's perfectly possible just about to believe in both. So to accept the scientific evidence for evolution and to look at the creation model as almost being a simplistic explanation for evolution rather than taking like a literalist view of scripture if you like 
That's how I would prefer it. But from a scientific point of view, you present them with the evidence and you have to conclude that evolution has occurred. And that's why it's brilliant to come here and see pentadactyl limbs and it really makes it live for them, which is why this is like a really, really fantastic day. The Natural History Museum's approach in examining the religious arguments alongside the evolutionary evidence has also been developed in Jungle Book style by this head of science from Lancashire. Okay, this is the lineup of human history, okay? Caroline Molyneux from the Balshaw Church of England High School in Leyland was the outstanding teacher of the year in North West England in 2007. One of the apes is the oldest, most ancient ape here. Then we've got the next ape that came in history. Then we've got the next one and finally the present day human. <coughs> Can we tell which one that is? Okay. Jay, she won the award because of lessons like this one on evolution, which engross and entertain her class. Jay, can you go and put them in order, please? Okay, you happy with that? Why do you think that? Because that's bigger. Okay, <laughs> that one's bigger, right? And Anything that one's else? like a human. Yeah, that one's got some human features. Okay, right, thank you very much, Jim. They, they believe but once they understand evolution, these pupils also stage a great debate. Caroline helps the evolution side, while a local chaplain joins the creationist corner. So you're kind of saying that evolution doesn't explain the development of really complex um, organisms on Mars, I guess? Yeah, it's like evolution, it's saying that very minor things happen. Something like the eyeball is that advanced that it, I don't yeah, believe yeah, it could right, have been. Interestingly, Darwin also worried about the origin of eyes, until he grasped what he described as the vastness of past ages, the millions of years that complex organs took to evolve. How do you know Darwin's theory is so trustworthy? Because you've got the quite a bit of proof about how species changed after a certain amount of time, and he also proved about different, the same species, but so how, they, how they changed differently in different areas. Yeah, there's, yeah but there's many gaps in science. But what um, gaps have you got for God? There's not a gap, it's just not there, full stop. Maybe he was the one who actually created evolution. Maybe he was left left us here to adapt by ourselves. In general, science, you know, if you can create some passion for it, then they're engaging, they're learning, and um, it's a real triumph, I think. By allowing children to um, argue, not necessarily their opinion, you're facilitating their investigative skills and you're facilitating their um, empathy skills. Some people find it better to believe in something than nothing. Yeah, we do believe in something, that's and evolution. I know exactly what you know the theories are and the evidence is for evolution, and I know exactly what the pupils need to know um, for, the, for the exams, which is, at the end of the day, what we're trying to teach them. But I think um, that by using this process, it will help them to remember, it will help them to engage, and so you just almost bring in a bit of um, a bit of kind of I want to say devil's advocate it's not just me saying I think this it's saying actually Christians believe the Bible and let's look at what the Bible says and then the pupils can look at that for themselves um, so I'm always really careful to say Christians believe and the Bible says um, as terms so they can see that it's not I say you have to believe this. Not even. It's lessons like this that teach the facts and encourage debate that are applauded by Michael Rice. <laughs> There's been quite a move the last 10 years to realising the value of good argumentation discussion in science lessons, and I'd like to see more of that. When I was at school, we had science teachers, one in particular who taught us physics, who seemed to be capable of letting us discuss just about anything. But he was also good enough that after five or ten minutes, we'd come back to the main thrust of the lesson. Jeremy Pritchard wants to ensure that evolution can't be avoided and that all children understand its pivotal importance by reinforcing its place in the national curriculum. I think often at schools there might be one or two or maybe three lessons of evolution and it's not plugged into the whole biological story. You can, they're, they're, it's almost a pick and mix that you can do microbiology and now we'll do plants, now we'll do the circulation system, whereas in fact they're all adaptations, they're all consequences of evolution or a way of increasing your fitness and I would argue that would be a much better way of teaching uh, biology at A level, but currently that's not the way it's done. So do you think that there's a fundamental problem with the way that evolution is taught as part of the national curriculum? I think it probably is, and I think, I think that it's a consequence of, of uh, over-assessment and, uh, and consequent lack of engagement of the pupils, and the teachers are, are, are 
rushing around trying to tick all the boxes and, and you can't take your foot off the gas and then enjoy and appreciate the subject. And I think evolution, teaching of evolution, always engages and it, it's a good place to start. And I think maybe, maybe the QCA should be starting from that point. With all the shrill debate about teaching creationism and evolution in the media, it seems that the reality in the classroom is that it's far more calm. Evolution underpins all aspects of biology, and as such should be at the core of the biology curriculum. Creationism plays no part in that process, but teachers should be equipped to deal with creationism when it arises. We've seen from the activities at the Natural History Museum that this can help pupils understand that creationism is not science, and as such, it can inform the scientific process.